Well, good morning. Uh, back several years ago when I first sensed that God might have me shift from uh, what I was focused on in life and the direction I was headed on towards ministry and that he would want me to serve as a pastor, I really didn't know what that meant. Like, I was going to a church while I was at university, and it was almost as if, you know, over a period of months, it wasn't just like a lightning bolt out of the sky, God impressed upon me that I want you to do what that pastor is doing up front, that I, I didn't know, but I was listening to him preach each week. And so I went to two of the staff members at my local church where I grew up, and I said, hey, I feel like God may be calling me to serve as a pastor, I don't know what that means, can I ask you a list of questions? And so they said, sure. And the, one of the first questions I asked was, tell me, what do you like about what you do? What, what are some of your greatest joys in ministry? What do you like most about your job? And the preacher at the time, you know, smiled and looked at me and he said, well, that's, that's easy. It's the people. Being with them, serving them, sharing life with them, like the people are by far my favorite part of this job. And so I asked him the natural follow-up question. I go, hey, what, what do you like least about your job? Like, what, what's the greatest challenge that you have as a pastor? And he, uh, he smiled, and he looked down, and then looked back up, and, and what seemed to me a totally unrehearsed answer said, the people, <laughs> being with them, serving them, sharing life with them. He's like, the people are by far the hardest part of, of this job. People, right? It, it, I don't think this is unique to ministry. I don't think this is a challenge unique just to ministry. You could, it, it's been said that family work, school, all of it would be perfect if it were not for the people who are involved. And, and you could plug in your area of expertise too. It could be healthcare, coaching, business, military, politics. You know, it, the truth is that relationships bring us some of life's greatest joys, but they also cause us some of life's deepest pain. And that's why it's, it's good news that the Bible offers us some hope uh, for the most important and also most difficult relationships in our life. And that's what we're going to talk about for the next five weeks. we got a series by that same title, Hope for Hard Relationships. It's going to take us through Mother's Day weekend. And, and most weeks we're going to look at a specific relationship. Like how do we navigate this one particularly complex, um, complex relationship with another person or with other people. But today I want to paint in sort of a broad brush stroke. And so I want to talk just more, lay some foundation down for how we handle conflict with another person, how we handle disagreements. And if there is a specific point of application this morning, it would be most along the lines of how do we handle ideological conflict with, with someone else? So even think about it in terms of the culture. If, if in any sense uh, our culture and the Christian faith uh, could be said that they're opposed with one another, well, how do we engage that, that conflict in a way that honors God and also could perhaps uh, let people know that there is a God who loves them very much? And so that's the, the focus that we're going to have. We're going to be in Romans chapter 12. So if you have a Bible or a Bible app and you want to turn um, towards the New Testament, which is the back of your Bible, and then halfway through the New Testament, you'll find the book of Romans. It's 16 chapters long. We want to be in Romans chapter 12. And eventually we're going to be looking at verses 14 through 21 as the main text. But I, I want to start by setting the context of the, the letter. Romans is largely considered to be a theological masterpiece. It's this elaborate reflection on who Jesus is and what he's done and what his life and death have accomplished. Uh, it's all that and more. So that's why for centuries, many people have turned to Romans and just said, this is a place where we can really find a rich understanding of, of the cross and the gospel. But it's also a letter that is written to a church struggling to navigate some pretty complex relationships, both within their congregation and also um, within the broader community. And so before we get to verse 14, we need to set the context by looking at Romans 12, verse 1. The, the first 11 chapters are laying really a theological groundwork and kind of some philosophical underpinnings of the Christian faith. They, they deal with first principles. Who's God? What's God's relationship to the world? Why did the cross have to happen? Um, what's Jesus' relationship to the Old Testament? That's the first 11 chapters of the book of Romans. And then in chapter 12, there's a shift um, from some of this theological discussion to more of the practical application of our faith. And so in the, in the first 11 chapters, if Paul's telling us, here's the gospel message, in chapters 12 through 16, he's saying, here's the implication of the gospel in your life. And this is where the turn takes place. Romans 12, verse 1. It says, therefore, so therefore, the first 11 chapters, in light of the first 11 chapters, therefore, in view, I urge you, brothers and sisters, in view of God's mercy, to offer your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and pleasing to God, 
This is your true and proper worship. Now, if you're a person who likes to take notes, I would maybe underline that word true or, or circle that word true. In the Greek language, that's actually our English word logical. Logikos is, is the word there. So true here, what it means is this, and I think I had some confusion. I was talking with someone last hour, some confusion about this. I'm not, not trying to oppose truth and logic. It's saying this is our logical response to God. In view of who God is and what he has done for us, the logical response for you and I is that we offer our lives back to God. Like that's the essence of worship. Our life is not our own, our own to live. It's to be offered back to, to him. That's what worship looks like. And what we're gonna see in the passage that we'll read in a minute is that means our faith has both a vertical and also a horizontal component. That our relationship with God, vertical, is going to impact our relationship with other people. And that's really not that all earth shattering. Like Romans isn't the first place to say that. Jesus talked a lot about that. Jesus said, hey, when he was asked about the greatest commandment, he said, well, the greatest commandment is love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind, with all your strength. And then he said, the second greatest commandment is like that, love your neighbor as yourself. And so Jesus was saying our logical response to God is, is both up and then it's also out. And that's part of the reason why, as a church, our mission is normally captured in three words, redeem, restore, renew, uh, redeeming lives, restoring relationships, and renewing communities through Jesus Christ. And what it means is we believe every person needs to have a saving relationship with Jesus, that, that we can't get where we want to go um, on our own, that we need God to rescue us from our sin and from our shortcomings, um, and that, that the true life we were created for can't happen apart from Christ, and that begins now and it stretches for all eternity. And so if someone doesn't know Jesus, we want to help introduce them to, to Christ. But our faith doesn't stop there, does it? Our faith in Jesus then impacts our relationships, and so we also want to see restored relationships with other people, and it inspires our engagement in our community. Redeeming lives, restoring relationships, renewing communities through Jesus Christ. Now, the, the somewhat negative side of that is that the more you engage in other relationships and engage in your community, you come into to conflict and you come into friction and you sometimes have to end up going people, right? <laughs> like people. And so that's why it's important that we talk about hope for hard relationships. And so let's look at Romans 12 verses 14 through 21. I want to get a sense of uh, what Paul tells us here. And I'm going to invite you to stand with me as we read uh, these words we stand out of respect for the word of God. We stand to receive, even to say in our posture, God, I wanna receive from you what you have for me today. And I'm just gonna warn you in advance, this is, uh, this is not an easy passage of scripture for us to, to take and then apply to our life. And um, we, we saw that last hour for the first time ever, I had someone stand up and shout me down in the middle of a sermon. So uh, let's hope this hour is better, right? Like let's, uh, you're like, what are we getting into? And as we all look at this, so. Romans 12, starting at verse 14. Bless those who persecute you. Bless and do not curse. Rejoice with those who rejoice. Mourn with those who mourn. Live in harmony with one another. Do not be proud, but willing to associate with people of low position. Do not be conceited. Do not repay anyone evil for evil. Be careful to do what is right in the eyes of everyone. If it is possible, as far as it depends upon you, live at peace with everyone. Do not take revenge, my dear friends, but leave room for God's wrath. For it is written, it is mine to avenge, I will repay, says the Lord. On the contrary, if your enemy is hungry, feed him. If he is thirsty, give him something to drink. In doing this, you will heap burning coals on his head." Now that's a quote from the Old Testament. It sounds kind of morbid. Like this is not saying, you know, you're gonna make their experience in hell worse. Or, like that's not the idea here. The idea, we'll talk about what the idea is here, but he says, in doing this, returning evil with good, you will heap burning coals on his head. And then he offers a summary in verse 21. Do not be overcome by evil, but overcome evil with good. It's the word of the Lord, amen? You, you may have a seat. The, the, the truth Paul shares here. Um, is really important, and as I mentioned, Romans 12 is part of an overall argument that he's making. It's part of his overall message to the, the church in Rome that's trying to navigate some pretty complex relationships, and yet the truth that he offers in these seven or eight verses, also as we read it, 
sounds a little disconnected. Like, for example, having said, bless those who persecute you in verse 14, it's not immediately clear why Paul then goes on to say, rejoice with those who rejoice and mourn with those who mourn. It's almost like these, these pieces of truth or these verses are stacked on top of one another with, with no clear relationship to each other. It almost reads like the book of Proverbs in the Old Testament. If you've read Proverbs before, just this collection of wisdom sayings, sometimes you can see a level of connection, but oftentimes you can't tell how it fits together. And so in light of this, I think it will be helpful if we work through this passage statement by statement, verse by verse, and by hoping, hopefully by making sense of the parts, we can get a good sense of what the Bible is trying to tell us as a whole. So let's look again here at verse 14. Bless those who persecute you, bless and do not curse. I want you to notice right from the start, if, if we don't if we don't capture this and understand where this is coming from, we're gonna have a difficulty understanding and applying the rest of what Paul says. I want you to notice from the beginning, bless those who persecute you, bless and do not curse, that Paul assumes a level of persecution. Paul is writing in a situation in which the church doesn't have a lot of power, and so it's a different age than it is today, but he's still assuming, listen, if you're gonna follow Jesus, if you're gonna walk faithfully with him, there is going to be times that you receive some level of backlash, some level of conflict because of your faith. There's one commentator on Romans who put it this way. He said, the fact Paul takes for granted that persecution and malice would be directed against the small church is significant. It speaks of the atmosphere of threat and intimidation within which these Christians had to live out their discipleship. The point is simply that Romans is written from a perspective in which the church holds the minority position within the culture, okay? It's written from the perspective in which the church holds the minority position within the culture, and that's important because there was some commotion created just a couple of weeks ago uh, when Gallup, Gallup is a research institution that does really good work, and they released some data suggesting that U.S. adults, that, that less than 50% of U.S. adults are now um, actively involved in a church. The, the number that they gave, I believe, was 48%. It was the lowest number since the late 1930s. And so Gallup came out with this new data that says less than half of adult Americans are engaged in a, in a church body. And then an article soon followed, a week later in the Los Angeles Times, that declared, hey, this is a win for America. Like, this is a good thing, because if we have less than half of the population engaged in a church, um, from their perspective, this was going to be a positive thing moving forward, and so they talked about why this was so good. I'm not, I don't want to spend much time on either one of these articles, but together, these reports reflect a general feeling that at least in some sections of the, the culture, some segments of the population, that the church holds a lot less sway than it did 50, 25, or even as little as 10 years ago. And, and I, would, I would suggest that anecdotally, just from looking at the world, like that seems like that's probably true. That the church holds less sway now than it did um, even a few years ago. But I would also suggest that that data can be misleading. As a pastor, I want everybody to have a relationship with Jesus. I think that that's crucial. I think that we need that in order to, to live with God forever. I, I think that's why Jesus came to die for our sins. Like I want everyone to have a relationship with Jesus, and so I, I want more and more people to know him. I also believe that those who know Jesus um, should be part of a local church. And so anytime I meet someone, they tell me that they, you know, if they, it comes up that they're a Christian, I'll, I'll normally ask them, hey, what, what, what church are you plugged into or involved with? And, and every once in a while, I'll come across someone who will say something along the lines of, well, I'm not involved in a church. Like, I, I love Jesus, but uh, I hate the church, or I love Jesus, but I don't really have much use for church, or I don't appreciate what churches um, do or some of the scandals in certain churches, and I, I totally get where that's coming from, right? Like churches, people, right? Like ch churches are full of people, and people are imperfect even within the church, and so churches sometimes can hurt, hurt their members. We, we can hurt one another. Um, churches have been involved in covering up scandals at times that, that have done damage to people. Like, you know, that, that's all real, but, but I will often want to say or sometimes say to people, listen, if you, if you say you love Jesus but you hate the church, you need to go back and look at a lot of what Jesus talked about. Because part of Jesus' message and, and the New Testament's message is the beauty of what happens when you have all these different people who do hurt one another and who are imperfect gathering together and uniting around Jesus in spite of their imperfections because there's a beauty in that grace that can reflect to the world that, hey, there's a God who loves you. 
And there's something bigger that can unite us than all the things that sometimes divide. And so um, there's a power of being part in a, in a local church that you can't get by being sort of a rogue Christian who's, who's doing this on their own. So I say that just to let you know, I believe that people need a relationship with Jesus. I believe they should be part of a local church. But I would also say there are more than a few benefits of living in an age when Christians don't get to call all of the shots. So let me give you just a few of the benefits that I think can come about from this data released by Gallup and then the article that came in the the Los Angeles Times. Um, By living as a minority belief system, we're reminded where our true hope lies. And our hope is not in uh, a political party. Our hope is not in any sort of leader. Our hope is not in power. Our hope is not in the Supreme Court. Like our hope is in Christ, period. It's in Jesus, period. And we, we've talked a lot about that over the past 18 months because it's been an election year. It was a contentious election. Like, so I don't need to belabor that, but that's one of the benefits of living perhaps as a minority belief system. If that's the case, is like we're reminded where our true hope lies. Number two, it means that those who do attend church are likely to be more committed and unified than perhaps in the past. And I know that there could be exceptions to that, that rule, but we're, we're past the stage where, where people come to church just because they're expected to come. Like that, that age is largely over. We're also past the age in which if you're a business person, that it's somehow better for your business that you're part of a church than, than not being part of a church. I, th- I think that age is largely over as well. So if, if you are part of a church family, you're there either because you believe Jesus is the son of God or you're seeking out what you believe. And either way, this gives the church a, a measure of focus in its mission. All right, here's what we're doing. Here's what we're all about. So it can help our focus. And finally, number three, living as a minority belief system can help us have a more accurate reading of the Bible, and particularly the New Testament. And the reason I say that is, again, that the New Testament was written at a time when Christians did not have much power. Romans is written from the perspective in which the church holds the minority position within the culture. The the, the church began as an offset of Judaism. And so in the book of Acts, the church starts with 120 people who are loyal to Jesus, and that number soon um, grows to a few thousand. And the church spreads throughout the Middle East and throughout the Mediterranean. But even when we come to the letter um, written to the church in Rome, Romans, this was written some 15 to 20 years after Jesus rose from the dead. The church really has very little power in the world. Even in Rome, Christians had started to become noticed uh, but they didn't, they didn't have much sway. And so case in point, the emperor at the time, Emperor Nero, famously blamed Christians uh, for a fire he started. I don't know if you know this story, but Nero wanted to construct some new building projects, but he couldn't justify it economically. He didn't have the political power at the time to pull the strings to get it done. And so what he did was he committed arson, and then he blamed the Christians for it. And he saw it as a win-win, because he wound up with his buildings And he also gave the Christians a bad name, and the church could do very little about it, which makes it all the more striking. Paul advocates for such a positive response to any antagonism that may come our way. He says, bless those who persecute you, bless and do not curse. Bless those who persecute you, bless and do not curse. You might put it this way. In this section of Romans, Paul wants to help the church see how it can wield influence even when it doesn't have power. Influence is more important than power. Jesus talked about that too. Jesus said, the rulers of this world, uh, they, they lord power over you. They hold power over you to manipulate and to control. He goes, not so with you. He goes, you're not to be one that uses power in this way. You are to be one who comes along and serves. He says, I'm among you as one who serves. The greatest is the one who serves. I've come not to be served, but to give my life as a ransom for many. And so the world uses power to control The church and the way of Christ is to wield influence through service. And and that's been the the church's way since its inception. And in many ways, by finding ourselves in more of a minority position today, the church is equipped um, to work with the tools God initially gave us. So when Paul encourages the church, bless those who persecute you, bless and do not curse, we need to hear that. Because he gives us hope even when we find ourselves in conflict um, with the broader culture. And so he says that in verse 14. Verse 15 and the start of verse 16. Rejoice with those who rejoice. Mourn with those who mourn. Live in harmony with one another. This live in harmony with one another is a way of expressing what's kind of an awkward phrase in the Greek language. Verse 16 literally says, think the same thing towards one another. So think about other people the way you think about yourself. Or think about other people the way you would want them to think about you. Oh, you say, Scott, what does that mean? 
Well, it means the person that I'm having conflict with, whether it's online or at school or at work or in my home or it's more of the culture in general, the person I'm having conflict with is a person created in God's image. They are a person with a story. They have wounds. They have gifts, fears, dreams, apprehensions, anxiety. Sometimes, like you, they pretend to be stronger than they really are. Sometimes, like me, they feel alone. They know the feeling of great joy and elation. They know the the pain of a broken heart. If you can think about people in this way, think about people the same way you think about yourself, um, we'll, we'll, we'll treat one another as human beings. We we won't treat other people as a project. We'll we'll treat them as another person. Not as an enemy, not as a nuisance. Um, We'll be able to rejoice with them in times of gladness. We'll be able to mourn with them in times of sorrow because we know what those experiences are like. Whether we see eye to eye to them with everything or not, we can be with them in those, um, in those highs and lows. We'll be able to, as Paul says in the second half of verse 16, to, to not be proud, but to be willing to associate with people of low position. He says, do not be conceited. Do not be conceited means don't be wise in your own eyes. Don't imagine that someone else has nothing to teach you. Don't imagine that um, just because it seems like someone has nothing to offer, they actually have nothing to offer. And you can think about that socioeconomically, like, you know, they make less than me, so they don't have anything to teach me, or they don't, have le- they don't have as much clout as I do in the community, so they have nothing to teach me, or they're an unbeliever and I'm a believer, so they have nothing to, to teach me. The idea here, Paul is saying, is don't assume that all of the goodness and all of the knowledge and all of the wisdom is in you, and that all of the um, ignorance and all of the evil is in them. And honestly, isn't that the way that we engage in dialogue with anyone anymore? Like we assume all the goodness, all the wisdom, all the knowledge is in me and in my position, all the, all the evil, all the wickedness, um, all the ignorance is in, is in them and that other person. It's, it's not even really dialogue anymore, it's just this echo chamber that we go back and forth with. Paul says, listen, that's not the way it should be. It's not the way it should be in, in conflict. Now, now when evil does come our way, because evil is real, and when someone is evil or when someone is under the influence of the evil one, because again, there's a real spiritual enemy named Satan who wants to destroy this world and destroy all that God cares about, Paul says, okay, I've got advice for you in that moment too. Do not repay anyone evil for evil. Be careful to do what is right in the eyes of, what's it say? Of everyone. Well, that's confusing, isn't it? Be careful to do what is right in the eyes of everyone. In, in conflict or disagreement, Followers of Jesus don't stoop to other people's level. We don't don't play dirty just because someone else is playing dirty. And and I think over the last however length of time, it's probably, if one thing frustrates me as much as anything else, it, it may be that, that at times followers of Jesus can can justify acting a certain way because they either say the stakes are so high that we need to act a certain way, or that someone else did this, and so we're just playing by the same rules. Verse 17 reminds us, listen, the world is quick to notice when Christians don't live according to their beliefs. And that that matters. Now, you could argue that it's unfair, and I I would agree with you in some ways that's unfair. If they were thinking about us the same way they think about themselves, which Paul tells us it would be good if all of us did, then they would realize you know, people don't always live in accordance with their beliefs, and sometimes we make mistakes, and so sometimes maybe more grace would even flow towards the, the church. But on the other hand, it's, it's totally fair. If Christians stoop to the level of others, we should be judged, not by the world standards, but by our own, because if we repay evil for evil, what makes us any different from someone who doesn't know Christ? If, if we use straw man arguments and extreme characterizations of people and their opinions in order to prove our point, What's any different from when people do that to you and your beliefs? And so Paul comes here and he, he talks about the type of reaction that we should have in these moments. And, and he's saying the type of reaction to conflict, when, this idea that of, of us repaying someone for what they've done to us, repaying evil for evil, it's really, it's rooted in one of two things, pride or fear. It's rooted in pride or fear, or it's even in some cases rooted in both. And, and I want to, explain or illustrate what I mean by pride and fear 
with an example that I know 98% of you are going to roll your eyes at when I give you the example, but stick with me for a moment um, because I hope it will help out. This is not when I got yelled at last hour, so this is a good thing at least. Um, some of you may be aware, Indiana basketball recently hired a new coach. Uh, they hired Mike Woodson. Uh, Mike Woodson was a player for IU back in the early 1980s. Uh, he actually uh, was one year the Big Ten MVP, even though he only played six games in the Big Ten season. Like, he was so dominant in six games, they just said, you're the MVP, man. Like, you were just so good, like, you're the MVP. And he went on to have a, an okay NBA career, and he coached in the NBA for a while, um, won a, a title as an assistant with the Detroit Pistons, coached a few teams as the head coach, had a mixed track record. So the jury is out of whether this is going to be a good hire or not. I'm, I'm more optimistic today than I was two weeks ago when they hired him, um, but that's not the point. That's not the point of, of bringing him up. When we first needed a coach, I say we because, again, I always tell people, I went to IU and I, my family gave them you know, $50,000 to help me be educated. So if someone wants to help offset that money, I'll root for UK but like, um, or U of L. But like, I'm indebted to some level to Indiana University, so that's why I say we. When we first needed a coach, nearly every IU fan I know, or at least this large swell of the, of the fandom, wanted Brad Stevens. Brad Stevens, if, if you're not a basketball fan, he, he led Butler University, like the tiny private school in Indianapolis, before they were really even any name. He led them to, to two consecutive Final Fours, two, two straight years, actually the final game for two straight years. And then in 2013, after doing that, he accepted a job to coach in the NBA, to coach the Boston Celtics. He grew up in Indiana. He was a lifelong Indiana fan. His dad went to IU. They went to IU games when he was growing up. And so he's always been this, the big fish that Indiana fans have thought, one day we're going to catch him and we're going to bring him back home. And there was a lot of commotion a few weeks ago in the national media when Indiana fans were thinking about they were going to hire Brad Stevens, where the national media said, Indiana fans are stupid. Like, like he's not coming back to Indiana. Like, Indiana fans are prideful. They're arrogant. They think their program is way better than their program really is. Like, I just can't believe they would ever think that he would come back. And I, one local news writer in Bloomington was asked about this. And he said, um, what do you make of the comments that Indiana fans are just arrogant and prideful and stupid and, like, he would never come back? And uh, the writer said something really insightful. He said, you know what? Some Indiana fans are arrogant because the program is not what it was 30 years ago. And so they do think the program is better than it really is, and it's, it's rooted in pride. But he said, I think for most of the fans, this emotion and this desire to bring Brad Stevens here is rooted in something different. It's, it's not driven by pride, it's driven by fear. And he went on to, to say, and this would be true of Kentucky as well, having lived here for eight years, that, that in the state of Indiana, in the state of Kentucky, basketball is part of the culture, right? Basketball is passed on from generation to generation. Basketball binds communities together. Um, basketball is sometimes the one thing that a father and son you know, can talk about. So it gets this relationship going. And the local writer said, IU fans don't think Stevens should come here because they believe somehow Indiana is a better job than the Boston Celtics. IU fans want Brad Stevens to come here because they're afraid of Indiana basketball becoming irrelevant. There's an important part of their culture that is slipping away and they're afraid of losing it. And so we want to catch this big fish and bring it back to prove that, that Indian ba Indiana basketball is relevant. And the news writer concluded by saying this, the national pundits are saying we're too prideful. I ultimately think it's more about fear than pride. The problem is that fear and pride often look the same. Fear and pride often look the same. Now, let's think about this in terms of uh, Christians engaging in conflict, sometimes with one another, but even more so maybe with the broader culture. Some Christians are nasty people because they're prideful. And they have no room for grace. And, and they don't remember what it was like to be far from God and to be brought into a saving relationship with him. And so they do think like all the good is in them and all the evil is in someone else. And like it, it, it's a pharisaical type attitude. There are some Christians who are like that. I don't think the vast ma majority are. I mean, for the vast majority, if, if we have some nastiness that comes out at us from time to time, and we do, it's, it's not rooted in pride, it's rooted in fear. Because we see an important part of our culture feeling like it's slipping away. Gallup saying, hey, less than half of U.S. adults are engaged in a church, and a Los Angeles Times article, or whatever else might be, and you go, and an important part of who we feel we are as a culture is starting to go away, and so we're afraid about losing what's important to us and what unites us, and so fear lashes out, Fear causes us to demonize 
Um, fear and pride can, can stir up the, most, the worst possible tactics. And so I think that's why Paul pumps the brakes here. And Paul says, when dealing with conflict, and he's going through all this, this, all this advice, he says, verse 17, do not repay anyone evil for evil. Be careful to do what is in, right in the eyes of, again, what's he say? Everyone. Now, he's not saying here that truth doesn't matter. Okay, when the letter makes the turn, Romans chapter 12, and he says, therefore, in view of God's mercy, offer your lives as a living sacrifice to God. This is your true and proper worship. This is your logical response to who God is. He goes on to say in verse two, do not conform to the pattern of this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Then you will be able to test and approve what God's will is, his good, pleasing, and perfect will. And so in our day, we would, we would recognize categories are changing. Right? Moral categories are changing. Sexual categories are changing. Paul says here, hey, the answer is not to conform to the cultural standard of the day. The answer is to be transformed. It's to hold on to the unchanging truth of God's word and allow it to renew your mind so that you can test and approve what God's will is, his good, pleasing, and perfect will. But we need to understand that that transformation in our life may take place in a culture or a family or a school or a place of work that doesn't respect that change within you that doesn't agree with your beliefs, that doesn't agree with the word of God that you are now basing your life upon. Like they don't come from the same place. So the question is, how do you influence people if they are already at odds with you? And Paul says, well, you do so by being careful to do what's right in the eyes of everybody. And that's when you wanna go, we we need Brad Stevens to call a timeout, right? Like what's going on? Like how can you do what's right in the eyes of of everyone because what's right in someone else's eyes and what's right in my eyes is what's causing this conflict to begin with. And that's why Paul would remind us, okay, what have I said? What do I mean here and what do I not mean? He's told us, hey listen, how do you do this? Think of others as you think of yourself. Prioritize influence over power. Do not be conceited, namely thinking that you have all the answers and that someone else can't help offer an important perspective you, you, you aren't free to compromise on God's word, but we can aim to do what's right in the others by making a series of commitments. Things like, I'll see the other person as created in the image of God. I will seek to understand their position in a way that they would agree with. I may not agree with it, but at least I can articulate what they believe in a way that they would go, yeah, that's what I believe. I, I will treat them as I want to be treated even if they don't return the favor. I will live with a sense of convicted civility. That's Richard Mao's term, that's not my term. Convicted civility. Many Christians can express their convictions boldly, but they, deva- they display civility very poorly. They know what they believe, but they can't engage with other people. Other Christians are remarkably civil. Like, they'll, just, they'll bend over backwards, you can run over them any day, they, but they don't know what they believe. And they don't know why they believe it, and they quickly give up their convictions if someone um, shows any resistance. Jesus demonstrated convicted civility. Jesus loved and cared for others without compromising his convictions, but he also had compassion upon people and their circumstances. He didn't bend upon God's word, but he stooped down to wash people's feet. Jesus demonstrated convicted civility. And so Paul, verse 18, he says, if it's possible, as far as it depends upon you, live at peace with everyone. And this goes for, this goes for the culture again. This also goes within your own home. Let's just not make it something out there where protects us, like this goes for in your own home. If it's possible, as far as it depends upon you, live at peace with everyone. I spoke with a member of our church a few weeks ago, probably six weeks ago or so now, after a service, and they, they just said, I need some prayer, uh, my family's in a difficult spot, and in their situation, they had one parent still alive, and the parent was aging, and they reached the point where now the children are taking care of the parent. And a lot of you have been there or you're walking through that right now. And uh, even though my parents are not at that age, I've, I've seen it some in my family. And that seems like that's one of the hardest, if not the hardest spot to be in as a family. Like where the kids are now caring for the parent. And in this case, this gentleman was saying, um, they're, not, they're not cooperating at all. They're not grateful at all. Like we're doing all that we can Um, to try to make things as good as it can be for them and and respond to their wishes, but also be honest with where things are and like they're just being hateful and spiteful. And he go, they recently 
threatened to like, I'm gonna write the whole family out of the will. Anything that I have is gonna go to other people, not to you, because again, you're the evil one, you're the, you're the one that's causing this. And so I said, I don't necessarily know all that you need to do, but I, I gave them this verse. I go, you need to read and pray through even part of Romans 12 to think through about just the posture of your heart as you engage in this, particularly verse 18. If it's possible, as far as it depends upon you, live at peace with everyone. Right? You can't determine what, what the other person is gonna do. Or you can't determine if they write you out of their will or, or, or not. But, but again, you have a limited amount of time left with this person and what you are gonna be able to answer for is how did I engage with them and what did I do um, in terms of loving my father before he passes from this life. And so what Paul says here is true of interpersonal relationships, um, but it also does have further implications. And so it's no accident that he goes on in Romans chapter 13 to talk about submitting to governing authorities. Like chapter 13 flows right out of chapter 12. And this was written at a time, again, when governing authorities weren't friendly to the church. And so this can apply to any possible situation you find yourself in. And you're gonna find yourself living at odds with people in your neighborhood or your family or your school or with people of other political persuasions or the government of your city or nation. And he says here, hold your convictions. Don't compromise your beliefs in terms of what you can control and how you conduct your life, but also try to live at peace with people who believe and live differently than you, at least to the best of your ability. That's what he's convicted civility. Now, the issue is that he doesn't give us an answer for every personal, social, or ideological conflict that we could ever have. Paul, he just doesn't give us an answer for those things. What he's doing is pointing us in a direction. He's saying, this, this is the trajectory that you need to be on. This is how you need to check your heart. Um, he's given us a vision for how to handle these things. There are times that you have to make really difficult decisions still. And so next week when we talk about marriage, there are times that one spouse is being abusive to the other and someone has to make the decision, um, I need to put some space between me and this other person because they are um, a threat to me and a threat to our children. And so um, I want to work this out, but we're also going to put some space here. And so, so part of convicted civility and part of as far as it depends upon me is actually pulling away from this relationship for a time as an ultimatum that this person can get some help. There are times you're gonna make really difficult decisions. I know there are some members of our church who are trying to sift through public school versus private school in light of some changes you know, in the world and like how do we figure all those things out? Like those are difficult decisions. Paul doesn't give an answer for everything here but he points us in a direction and he ultimately says at a foundational level when it comes to conflict, you have to entrust your hurts to the Lord. So he concludes this way, do not take revenge, my dear friends, but leave room for God's wrath, for it is written, it is mine to avenge, and I will repay, says the Lord. On the contrary, if your enemy is hungry, feed him. If he is thirsty, give him something to drink. In doing this, you will hurt, he will heap burning coals uh, upon his head. Again, not you're not sending the person, this is not gonna make hell worse for them. You are responding in a way by returning evil with good where in many cases, maybe not in every case, but in many cases, you're demonstrating two things. One, I trust God to work this out. And second, if you do that enough, for many people, they're gonna come to realize whatever I'm doing to this person is not eliciting the response I was hoping for. And it's gonna, it's gonna begin to shame them. Like, Maybe I am in the one wrong here because I keep coming out here in anger and they keep returning that with good. This ultimately boils down to, do you believe in the example of Jesus? Bless and do not curse. And do you trust in the judgment of God? Like God's gonna bring all wrongdoing into to light. Like do you believe that what Paul says here, what Romans is telling us is true or do you go, that's just advice for other people? Like this, this advice, this passage, this is talking about someone else's situation. This is not talking about my situation. Like God didn't have my situation on mind when he uh, inspired this to be in his word. Really? God didn't have your situation in mind when he included this in his word? Like God didn't have in mind the 21st century church even when he inspired this in his word. God could lead a fledgling New Testament church through the persecution of the Roman Empire but God can't lead the contemporary church through a situation where as many as 50% of the population holds the same worldview? Like, God can't do that? And if that's the way that we, we act or we sometimes feel, what it shows us, what it shows us is that no matter how passionately we worship last weekend, we don't really believe that Easter is true. 
we've become enslaved either to pride or to, to fear. And the truth is, the cross doesn't leave any room for pride. Because all of us have to come before Jesus and we have to admit our sin and mistakes and we have to ask for his forgiveness. Like the cross leaves no room for pride and the resurrection gives us no reason for fear. Because if Jesus rose from the grave and he got up, then everything is going to be okay. And we see things right now that are broken and we see things in this world that are wrong, but nothing is gonna hinder the purposes of God. And just as we said last week, there are moments when it appears Jesus is in the position of weakness and he's taking the position of a servant and he's washing feet or he's hanging on the cross or it seems like the church isn't having the sway it once had. Jesus is always the one who remains in control. And as the one in control with all authority, he gives us the marching orders for how to respond to conflict, disagreement, and hard relationships. And, and I'll tell you, it's gonna get harder before it gets easier. I don't imagine because I preached this message that now it's gonna be easier this week, right? Like, it's gonna get harder before it gets easier, but the church has always thrived in a position of weakness. The church has always thrived in a position, like, historically, the church is thriving in South America and Africa and places where it doesn't have some of the benefits that we have, and so um, when we find ourselves in a place of weakness, we have to trust God's word, we have to trust his work. And so what I wanna encourage you to do is I, before I read this passage one final time and we close, if you're comfortable, I'd ask you just to close your eyes for a moment. And I, I wanna lead us in prayer. And the reason I'm having you close your eyes is there are a thousand different ways we could apply Romans 12 to our lives. And, and I don't know the way that this truth needs to be applied to your life. I don't know where you're having conflict. I don't know where you're having fear or pride. Um, it may involve social media, it may involve people in your house, it may involve people at work. I, I just don't, I don't know how it needs to be applied. And so I wanna read these words again, and I wanna ask you as I read them, have your eyes closed and just ask the Spirit of God that inspired these words to be written. Ask, ask God's Spirit to show you how this truth needs to be worked into your life and how God would ask you to respond to it. So here we go, Romans 12, 14. Bless those who persecute you, bless and do not curse. Rejoice with those who rejoice. Mourn with those who mourn. Live in harmony with one another. Do not be proud, but be willing to associate with people of low position. Do not be conceited. Do not repay anyone evil for evil. Be careful to do what is right in the eyes of everyone. If it is possible, as far as it depends upon you, live at peace with everyone. Do not take revenge, my dear friends, but leave room for God's wrath, for it is written, it is mine to avenge, I will repay, says the Lord. On the contrary, if your enemy is hungry, feed him. If he is thirsty, give him something to drink. In doing this, you will heap burning coals on his head. Do not be overcome by evil, but overcome evil with good. Father, we believe that these words are true. We believe you included these words in your scriptures because we need them. We, we need to remember in times when it feels like we're on the receiving end or the losing end or we're afraid that we're losing an important part of our identity or our culture or we're having conflict at home. Like We need to believe that you've given us a way that we can navigate through that. And that doesn't, eliminate the need for prayer and discernment and maybe getting advice from other people about what the best move is. But God, you have certainly set a trajectory and a vision for us to follow. And I pray that we would, we would believe that you are in control and that you're good, and that the resurrection is true. And so there is no room for pride. There is no reason for fear. You've got this. And so we give over any conflict to you and we ask for you to make your name great in our lives, in our community, and in this world. We love you and pray all these things in Jesus' name. All God's people said, amen.